just a quick word um, for housekeeping. This morning we will do communion in the quote unquote drive by manner. So I just want to give people a heads up. And there will be a children's message uh, in place of the Sunday school dismissal. Thank you. Please rise and face the cross. Easter gospel this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him, The guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there 
they will see me. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Jesus God's Son, risen from the dead. All praise to God the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. In preparation to receive his Holy Supper this morning, let us confess our sins to God our Father and receive his forgiveness, that we may be reconciled to him and to one another. We pause for a silent reflection in preparation. Merciful and risen Savior, we claim to be people of the resurrection. Our living Lord and Savior forgives the most impossible sins, overcomes the greatest fears, comforts the loudest cries, and breaks down the strongest barriers to his love and peace. Through the resurrection, Christ's power in the Holy Spirit lives and works here and now. My friends, know that as God's own, we are forgiven and be at peace. You may be seated for our hymn of praise.
Please rise for prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, the Father, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life to us. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our verse reading this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 10, beginning at 34th verse. 
Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives
Our epistle reading this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord.
thank you, choir. Uh, this time I invite the children forward to come on up here in the chancel for a special Easter children's message. I almost forgot. I got treats too for anybody who can make it. Yeah, come on up here. Yeah, just sit anywhere. There's lots of room. Hi, guys. Yes, I will be giving you these treats in just a few moments. Oh, yeah? Okay, go ahead and have a seat, everybody. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, what's the deal today, kids? What's the special occasion for? Who knows what special day this is today? Easter. Easter, exactly. And we got some special activities for you, and they're all related to the meaning of Easter. And so I want to give you guys like a heads up about the Easter egg hunt that's going to happen after service. Hopefully you guys can all stick around. Matter of fact, right now, can anybody see the hidden egg on, on the chancel? It's somewhere. And, oh, there it is. Get it. Here, bring it over here, Abby, or Ellie. Okay, I should know your name. Um, now, this is how it's going to go. You might at first be a little bit disappointed because, go ahead and open it. Tell me what's inside. Nothing, it's empty, just like what? In the story of Jesus rising from the dead. What did the disciples? The tomb tomb was empty. So every time you go and get an egg today, you're going to think, is there candy? Is there candy? Open it up and say to yourself, he is not here. He is risen. All right? And then go get another egg and open it up, and you'll find this. No, I mean after the service. (laughs) After the service. Now, this is the real important part, okay? (laughs) After you get your eggs, and we know there's no candy in them, then you go up to the candy lady at the candy table, and you have to say this. You say this to her, he is risen, and then she'll say back to you, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hey, there people are going to do it. Let's try it. I'll say it. He is risen. That's how it's going to go. And if you do that just right, just like that, you get candy like I'm going to give you right now. And the candy is the sweet little reminder of the sweetness of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins and rose for our justification. So we're going to let you guys get candy and then you go back and you go back to sit, sit with mom and dad and we're going to sing page nine, Christ the Lord is risen today. But don't leave without your candy first. Everybody gets one. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox, AKA, what's that also known as? It happens in the spring. You get points for stepping out first. Good job. Anybody know what it is? Uh, close. It's numbered from Passover. It's Easter. They're all related. I'll give you credit for that, Ted. First Sunday after the first full moon. Well, the calendar date is better known as Easter, of course, and I like also the other name for it, Resurrection Sunday. That one's got a really nice ring to it to me. So why then, you might be asking, why, Pastor Mike, after this great jubilant, festive, and triumphant start with the procession and bells and choirs and everything, why in the world would you throw a wet blanket on it all by describing Easter in such a Debbie Downer, dry, and detached way? Fear not, it only sounds anticlimactic, I pray. The first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox, though awkward, it also conveys something really important that we sometimes inadvertently leave out of our high praise and hallelujah Easter celebration. And I'm talking about the cosmic element. It's cosmic. The repercussions of this day on which we celebrate our Lord's triumph over death in the grave, these repercussions certainly impact our weary hearts coming fresh off of our long Lenten journeys. Today with fresh hope, and renewed joy, we see our own lives lifted up, caught up in the ultimate victory which our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ freely shares with us. Because I live, Jesus declares, you also shall live. John 14, 19. Amen to that one. But creation itself also joins our chorus of hallelujahs, and at the same time, gives off a few groans and moans too, which we can relate to with respect to our own bodies, I'm sure. Today's gospel records, and behold, there was a great earthquake. When the angel came down, removed the stone, Matthew's gospel also records the earthquakes in the previous chapter taking place when Jesus on the cross yields up his spirit. And this is where we begin to see a hint of the redemptive repercussions on a more cosmic scale. I think today we can all vouch for the reality of Romans 8 in our own times. I'm talking about natural disasters, hurricanes, snowstorms, and those uh, rivers, atmospheric rivers that have come to our own state, California. This is what Romans 8, 19 says, for the creation waits with eager longing and for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, our redemption, the redemption of our bodies when Christ returns, and the redemption of creation, they're tied together. They seem to be linked. St. Paul has a little bit more to say from Romans chapter 8 on this. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans 8. You can see the link there between our earthly bodies and the groaning earth itself. But it wouldn't just be the earth alone in the big picture, because the book of Revelation talks about the new heavens and the new earth that await our Lord's return. Jesus says himself in Revelation 21, behold, I make all things new. So we're talking about a true cosmic repercussions here that our Lord's resurrection from the dead inaugurates on that first Easter morning. A new day has dawned. A new era has begun. Jesus is the true first fruits of the resurrection. Unlike, say, Lazarus, whom we read about a few weeks ago, Lazarus, whose resurrected body would presumably grow old and he'd have to die all over again. But Jesus himself emerges from the dead 
with a glorified body that seems to share certain qualities, yes, of his Bethlehem body, if we can call it that. That is, Jesus eats fish with his disciples after his resurrection. He takes drinks. He walks on the beach, walks on the paths, and receives hugs, especially around his ankles, all of which seem natural enough. He even says to his disciples that he is not a spirit. Yet at the same time, he certainly comes and goes in more supernatural ways, doesn't he? Appearing behind locked doors, disappearing from the dinner table, just vanishing in an instant. And on Ascension Day, he floats up into the sky and is enveloped by a cloud. Now that's the kind of body I want to get in the glory. Whereas St. Paul affirms that we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit, Paul also writes that we groan inwardly. And sure, some of us groan outwardly too. As we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, also found in Romans chapter 8. So the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus will send after his ascension, the promised Holy Spirit takes up residence within us at our baptism, and he begins to transform us into Christ's image. And he begins to produce in us spiritual fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and it goes on. This sanctification, we call it, lasts the rest of our earthly lives, and it's never perfected this side of heaven. Now come, let us reason on, on this. If it were perfection that we were given in this life, would you still be so eagerly awaiting heaven and the Lord's kingdom? I know I certainly have a long way to go in the patience department specifically because just talking about this rich inheritance that awaits all of us as God's adopted children in Christ, all that really makes me just want to realize the blessings now. Lord, save now. Hosanna. Okay, so our gospel lesson today really brings us back down to earth now, so to speak. We're talking about all the cosmic repercussions of Easter, but the life after death event of Easter really starts very small, doesn't it? Think again also of Christ's birth. You have, you have this great company of heaven, the angelic heavenly host appearing with that heralding angel, all praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on, whose, on whom his favor rests. And to whom were these vast choirs of angels singing? To whom was this heavenly multitude performing once again? A few sleepy-eyed, lowly shepherds. That sure started small, didn't it? In our text, it's just a couple of Marys to witness this miraculous dawn of resurrection life, the beginning of a new creation. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, it says. We're not even totally sure who this other Mary was. Some say Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And it doesn't seem like Matthew was necessarily overexerting himself too much when it came to detailed identification here. Oh, it was just that other Mary, he writes. And when you start to piece it together with all four gospel accounts, you quickly realize there were quite a few other Marys. It seems like every other woman was named Mary in the New Testament. That said, how many people do you know were addressed by a holy angel? Of course, the standard greeting that an angel seems to be required to give when engaging humans is what? Fear not. So that's the first thing out of the angel's mouth to the women here in our gospel text. Interestingly, if you back up to verse 4, it says about the guards in front of the tomb, uh, it says, for fear of the angel, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So I find it kind of funny, but I'm glad it also didn't happen to me. The whole guard was paralyzed with fear at the sight of the angel. Apparently, this angel did nothing at all either to allay the guards' fears yeah, you guys should be very afraid, I think was the message. And now I'm thinking if I could scare people like that angel so easily, 
I don't think I would be a very angelic angel. Thank God I'm just a lowly sinner redeemed by a loving Savior. And these ladies obey the word of the Lord that came through the angel. It says they left with fear and joy. We see that combination a lot in Scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, for example. And then in John, 1 John, you find perfect love casts out all fear. So I think Luther, Luther did a nice job of fitting these two together that are apparent opposites. In a small catechism, he writes, you shall have no other gods before me. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And then the other explanations follow each commandment with a similar formula. We should fear and love God so that fear and love are brought together. So there's a difference between dread, which is what the tomb guardsmen experienced at the sight of the angel, that these men became like dead, probably turned uh, white, cadaverous white. That's dread. If it's what the demons had uh, when they screamed out, they always asked for Jesus Christ to show mercy upon them. They dreaded him, and for good reason. Then there's reverence. Reverence is that healthy fear of those whom you respect and obey willingly out of love and in recognition of your proper relationship with them. Honor your parents, for example. These women, the Marys in today's account, may have initially felt some dread also, but when the angel calmed them, saying, don't be afraid, their dread turned to something more like reverence. They weren't fearing for their lives at that point, but they obeyed and they went their way with fear and joy, it says. And while they were carrying out the angel's instructions, lo and behold, they are next visited by the risen Lord Jesus himself on their way back to Galilee. Now here's an interesting tie-in. Now it's Jesus, the risen Jesus himself, who uses that same reassuring word of comfort. Don't be afraid. But even before that, the women were already clasping his feet and worshiping him. So already they didn't let what fear they may have had obstruct their expression of love for their beloved teacher, Jesus. Jesus meets them, greets them, and then commissions these women. In that culture in that day now, a woman's testimony was deemed inadmissible in court, official court. Now this is something we find quite strange today. We might have some women lawyers even here t this morning. It's quite a bit different. But apparently Jesus was not a fan of this situation either because he chooses to reveal himself alive again to whom? First to women. And then he commissions the women. He sends them. He sends them to Galilee ahead of himself so that they can pass the message on to the 11. The word for send is apostello, from which we get our word apostle, which means sent one. So while the women weren't given any official office per se, they were given the privilege of first seeing the resurrected Messiah live, alive and well, and furthermore then, they were given the additional privilege of being apostles to the apostles, sent to tell. So what do you think happens then when the women reach the 11 disciples in Galilee and they tell the men what happened? You have to search for it in the Gospels here because only Luke finishes up this part of the story. Matthew kind of leaves you hanging on this. But what do you think happens? Luke writes, when the women came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others, but they did not believe the women. Kind of saw that one coming, right? Because this is what Luke says in chapter 24, verse 11. Because their words seemed to them like nonsense. That's what the scripture says. To put the best construction on this now, and to save all men from getting hit over their heads when reading this aloud with their wives, the best way to understand this portion of the gospel, I believe, is probably to strike up the apostles' reluctance to believe, not to the women's report, but to nothing else than their having no experience whatsoever of anyone being as brutalized as Jesus was, then crucified, then pierced through with a sword, and on top of all that, um, 
after they re after all that, Jesus is still able to return by the power of God on the third day from the dead. That's unprecedented, completely not part of any of their prior experience. So that's a big ask for anyone, really, to believe that. And that's why the mere fact that the women are the first to testify concerning all these things actually points to the authenticity of the report. Far from being an invalid testimony, think about it. In that day, if you were making up this story that you saw Jesus alive after being removed stone cold dead from the cross, you would not entrust the testimony of said events to those whose testimony was not legally recognized. I highly doubt you would do that. There are much better ways of fabricating the story. So in this case, the women being the first to testify to the resurrected Christ, that actually is a mark of authenticity. The reality of this probably happened just like that. And with that very small beginning, the two women, filled with a mix of fear and joy, will eventually be joined by the believing ten. And then with doubting Thomas finally coming along, the believing eleven. And then coming down all the way through history to you and me this morning, today. Today, more than two and a half billion people on this planet profess faith in our risen Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. Those are truly cosmic proportions. But that means that there are still billions left on this decaying planet who don't know that their sins are all paid up in full by a loving Savior. He has sent, since sent his spirit to his church on earth, and now in the power of his spirit, he is sending you and me. He is sending us to proclaim that first Easter message, the good news. He is risen. Amen. And then may he who began a good work in you bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now if you're like me at all, that whole idea of being sent by God with a message to tell, it might get you a little bit anxious or nervous. But one thing that helps us and that equips us, so many of you are equipped already to do just that because you grew up in the church reciting the Apostles' Creed, which we're going to confess now. And if you look at it the right way, it's just what you can offer somebody who asks you, what do Christians believe? What do you believe? Why do you go to church? So let's stand together, and we'll rehearse that one more time. Our Confession of Faith on page 10. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated at this time. We'll continue our worship with the offering.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our strength and our song, you have become our salvation. Receive our heartfelt thanks for your gracious deliverance in Christ Jesus, crucified and risen. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, in baptism you have joined us to Christ's death and his resurrection and made us citizens of your kingdom. Move our hearts to repentance, we pray, that we would set our minds on things above and be directed by your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, when doubt and fear weigh us down, console us with the certainty that Christ is risen from the dead and that he rules over all things for our good and greets us with life and his means of grace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, lead your people in your steadfast love and guide them in strength to your holy abode. Sanctify our homes, be the companion of those who live alone. Make our households places where your wisdom and grace are found. Lord, in your mercy. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Grant that all in authority would govern according to your will, maintaining order and curbing evil, that we may live in peace. Lord, in your mercy. Righteous Lord, you have seated Christ at your right hand for our deliverance. Remember those afflicted with illness and injury, all those we name in the silence of our hearts, even now. Grant all health and strength according to your will. Sustain them in faith, knowing that for Jesus' sake, you will raise them in glory on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, our strength and salvation, you delivered your people from bondage in Egypt by means of the Passover lamb. As we celebrate Christ, our Passover lamb, who has been sacrificed and raised from the dead, bless all who partake of his sacrament. Cleanse them from boasting, malice, and evil, and give them repentant hearts to receive him in sincerity and truth. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, thanks be to you for, your, for the victory over the grave through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember all who mourn, comfort them with the promise that you love them with an everlasting love and will raise them and all your people from the dead through the same Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right and good, salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb, which was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to him, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he blessed it, he gave it to him, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please rise. And now may this true body and true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and sustain you in the true Christian faith until life everlasting. Go in peace and with joy. Your sins have been forgiven. Amen. And we pray. We give thanks to you, risen Savior, for your body and blood, for the forgiveness of our, our sin and your victory over sin and death. We thank you that you have saved us. Fill our hearts with the joy of sins forgiven as we represent you and live for you in our daily lives. We pray in your name, O Christ. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And be seated for our closing hymn. Please rise for the last verse.
I'm not even going to ask you to sit because it's just be really quick. There's food for our souls that we just enjoyed, food for your bellies now. I'm a big spread out there, and there are eggs out there just waiting to be picked up and handled by your kids and grandkids. God bless you. Know your Redeemer lives. Have a great week, and happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen.